Well, welcome to the Watch Insider and Watchbox Studios. Perhaps you were expecting more? Truth be told, Brian Guffberg is stuck in traffic, so I'm flying solo tonight with a big pilot's watch from Russia and a full gallery of some of our finest watches. I've got a little bit of everything from the entry level to the top of the line, from vintage to contemporary, and of course, my personal favorite, complications. Welcome to our worldwide audience of watch collectors and enthusiasts. If you are chiming in, this is going to be a more interactive episode than others, so feel free to answer or ask questions participating in the chat box. Remember, it's just as good to give as to receive. If someone throws up a question and I can't field it, chime in. This is your show. Okay, let's get started. Let's start with the biggest watch on the table by far. And that's difficult considering we have a deep sea on the table, but this one takes the cake. For the 2011 model year, this is the IWC Big Pilots Watch 5004-31. This is the Moscow Boutique Edition from 2011, dedicated to 12-time Olympic gymnastic medalist Alexei Nemov, one of the most decorated Olympic athletes from Russia ever. Uh, the first of this 50-piece series went to Alexei. The second went to a certain Vladimir Putin. You can have number 32 on the table tonight. Now, it is the 5004 46.2 millimeters in stainless steel. It features a handsome and unique stenciled dial profile. So you can see how all of the numerals are almost like a big blue bubble letter because that particular shade of Russian blue would have been overwhelming had it been printed solid. So that handsome technique, the skeletonized, or maybe I should say stencil style numerals, helping to blunt the impact of that beautiful bright Russian blue. The dial also featuring Russian white and silver. You'll note white luminous. Nova, not the typical key lime coloration has been used for this Russian Olympic themed watch. Now it has the same IWC caliber 51111 an enormous automatic winder with a seven-day power reserve in a steel case. This watch features the Breguet overcoil hairspring, so no matter what position I hold it with respect to the camera, it's going to keep good time. The seven-day power reserve and automatic winding, a luxurious tandem. Of course, this may not be an everyday watch for many, so having that extended power reserve is quite a luxury. Common to all of the 5004s is an enormous knurled diamond-style, sometimes onion crown, as it's referred to. It is by itself 10.8 millimeters in diameter, and the alligator strap is about one quarter of an inch thick at its roots. This is a watch built with Russia in mind. Bigger and better in every way. 11 time zone country, no problem. Any one of them would look great on this IWC Moscow Boutique Limited Edition. So let's quickly throw this one on the wrist because it's absolutely crazy. A 46 millimeter watch, it's downsized from the watch that inspired it. Of course, the b -er, IWC reference 341 from the 1940s was the 55 millimeter Luftwaffe watch that inspired this monster. So 46 almost seems like the speedy reduced to the original B. Er. This is the Big Pilot's Watch Moscow Boutique Limited Edition Alexei Neymar. This is one of my favorite watches on the table tonight, and with a 56 and a half millimeter lug to lug span, my wrist can barely accommodate it, but if you like the oversized style, it's not totally crazy. It's got hacking seconds, quick set date, all the features you expect of a normal watch that you can wear every day, and even comes with a rather impressive full steel deployment clasp. I love that piece. Okay, one monster deserves another. We go from a monstrosity of the air in the big pilot's watch to a leviathan of the deep. So from a veritable Russian bear to a genuine shark. Well, Deep Sea Deep Blue. This is a watch that absolutely perplexes me. The Deep Sea was a watch that launched back in 2008 and never really had a constituency. It was never as cool as the Sea Dweller 40 that it replaced. It was never as cool as the Sub C. But with the Deep Blue variant that debuted in 2014, all of a sudden the Deep Sea was red hot. Now it's not hard to see why if you're a fan of color as I am, that gorgeous gradient dial in lacquer is going to turn you on. and it, Believe me, it definitely hits on all cylinders. This is one that needs to be explained. Now, James Cameron took his personal submarine, which was the coloration of the deep sea script, that electric green, which I adore, from the surface to the bottom of the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the ocean overall. So you went from light to dark, 
in a submarine that was the color of this script and named the Deep Sea Challenger. So now you know the genesis of this style. James Cameron associated with the Rolex brand one of the few times in history that a watch was not simply associated with a person. Like we've seen Steve McQueen wearing a Rolex 5512. We've heard of Steve McQueen GMT, or rather Explorer 2s. We've heard of Jean-Claude Killy Rolex Dato Compacts watches, but this watch is actually created in Cameron's image in memory of his epic 2012 dive and the movie that followed. Now it is 18 millimeters thick with a titanium case back and a ring lock system whereby a 5.5 millimeter thick crystal sits on a circular plinth and it's basically a cylinder that runs all the way through the watch to the solid case back, effectively a hamburger of a stress reduction system so that the front is pushing on the back and vice versa, allowing a 3,900 meter depth helium escape valve naturally. It actuates when the interior pressure of the watch following a saturation gas dive exceeds two bar with respect to the external environment. The idea being that the helium that accumulates in the watch during a saturation dive will not blow out the crystal or the seals. Now it has the coolest clasp of any current Rolex and I'm gonna show you why. This is glide lock, but not glide lock as you get it on a sub. Now you're familiar with the slider adjustment in the clasp of a Submariner. What you might not be familiar with is the fact that on the deep sea, you have a slider system that you can adjust when it's on the wrist. And the idea is a simple and logical one. Never take the watch off the wrist in a maritime environment because that's when it's gonna slip out of your hand and you're gonna drop the darn thing overboard and it's gonna sink. And granted, this watch can withstand over 12,000 feet of pressure and it's tested as such by Rolex, but there is absolutely no way you're getting it back at that point. Smart move by Rolex, a clasp that features this gorgeous deployable sawtooth retention system so you can slide and, should you wish, retract the system entirely. Now I'm going to show you something else that is unique to this particular setup. You've got the slider, so you have this external slider that you can use on the wrist, and then you've also got flip lock for a total of about two inches of extension. This is not just appropriate for a diving suit. You could put this thing over a space suit. I absolutely adore this watch, and of course, this is the 2014 to 2017 model. There have been some detailed revisions to the lugs and the bracelet this year, as well as the change from the 3135 in this watch to the 3235 with the 70 hour power reserve. Both of them are big, butch, and tough, and look awesome. Chromalite blue loom, I love the fact that it doesn't have the Cyclops eye, and because the crystal is so thick, almost six millimeters, I'm gonna clean this one off and let you see, but you get almost that off axis plexiglass distortion that you'd see on a vintage dive watch. I absolutely love that angle. This is a fun watch. And in case you missed it, it actually fits on my wrist. Let's do one quick strap up shot for the camera. 44 millimeters, 18 millimeters thick, yet yeah, I can wear this watch. So if you like the look, go for it. This watch is gonna fit a smaller wrist. My wrist is 16 and a half centimeters in circumference at its most flush. Sometimes it can be as small as 16 centimeters circumference. So this is a watch that anyone with a small wrist should consider. We have a try before you buy feature here at Watchbox. Seven days, no questions asked, return policy. You can actually try it on. If it doesn't feel right, send it back. Otherwise, get ready to rock summer 2018. Okay. Question from Tom P. Tim, how does the deep sea feel on your wrist? It is a watch that I would wear on its bracelet. I've seen aftermarket straps for it. It is heavy, but it's balanced. Now, if I put the whole thing back together, collapse the clasp, put the thing back on my wrist, it's properly sized. Now I can actually say that despite the fact that it is huge, once I scale things down with the adjustable clasp, I can wear this watch without any free play, without any motion that I don't intend. It's physically secure and I would wear this watch. It's not a thing that's ever gonna wear with discretion unless you're a big boy with a big wrist, in which case maybe a 40 millimeter sea dweller or sub is not for you. This is a watch that I would happily wear. It is comfortable and it fits securely in spite of its very considerable mass. It's got mass, but it's got class. Okay, so from a watch that has sort of a plexiglass style distortion, vintage evocative, let's go to the real thing. First and foremost, alarm watch, I'm gonna indulge us all.
Now, if that doesn't sound like much of an alarm to you, that's by design, because the caliber 956 in this 2011 Jaguar LeCoultre tribute to Deep Sea is designed to have a thunderous voice underwater with discretion above. So you have a system whereby the watch is actually designed to create a more significant and salient sonic signature when diving. Of course, the original E857 Deep Sea came out in late 1958 as a 1959 model, and it was a diving alarm. It was JLC's first pass as a diving watch, so it had a fixed bezel, but it had a diving alarm system as a Memovox, so you could set the alarm to the rough time when you should surface. The watch was simple and pared down, and if you're of the school of thought that deplores luxury watches, especially vintage-style luxury watches, with a date well, get ready to rock like I did at the prom, dateless. This watch is clean, this watch is cool, and this watch is historically true. Only one millimeter larger than the original, it's 40.5 millimeters in steel, and it actually comes with a separate plexiglass. It has a plexiglass crystal, and it comes with a second one that you can fit should this one ever become sufficiently disfigured that you'd wish to swap out. Now, it is a robustly water-resistant watch, a modern diver in vintage style. You can actually take this one into the sand and surf this summer with no regrets. It does have an embossed Tropic-style strap, so while the strap is leather, it is actually a Tropic-style strap from uh, in the image of the perforated strap that would have been used in the 1950s. So it has the look, throw this on any aftermarket accessory or JLC OEM strap, you're ready for summer. This is a great look and I'll show it to you on the wrist. Again, with no date, absolutely true to history, right down to the plexiglass and the approximation of the original size. This is a cool looking watch. And an alarm watch is suitable for all occasions. If you're not into the Memovox Polaris, of 2018, and you think there are simply too many tribute to Polaris floating around. This is a rare U.S. dial tribute to Deep Sea. They made 359 of this U.S. LeCoult dial signed variant, making it far, far less common than its companion, the 959 piece Jaguar LeCoult dial tribute to Deep Sea variant. So this is the one to own. Scarcity and style in equal measure and a very wearable modern sports watch. Hey, Fjord Prefix saying, hey guys, I'm late to the party. That is all right. Uh, we love you all the same. I'm glad you could join us. Peter K joining us saying that Deep Sea is heavy. That's a fact. True Lie saying, is the updated Deep Sea equipped with a thicker bracelet? It's not thicker. It's a little bit broader at the lug, and the lugs have been reprofiled a little bit. So the shaping of the lug and bracelet junction has changed. Aesthetically, that's all that really changes. The big change is inside the case. Frankly, 48-hour power reserve, 70-hour power reserve, it's all the same to me. I'm going to wear my watch every day. I can see right here Steve Bowden, a fan of that deep sea. Abdul Rahman saying stunning watch has a 50 fathoms feel to it. You know, I can kind of agree to that. I think it, it feels a little bit more like one of the mil specs or the 38 millimeter bathyscaphe. It feels like one of the more pared down 50 fathoms iterations. Historically inspired, but holding the line on size. And I can see Colin Carpenter saying that alarm sounds like a hive of bald-faced hornets. Well, I can say this, underwater, I've actually experienced one of these underwater, it sounds like someone beating on a drum. So it's certainly engineered for a purpose. You can hear it on the surface. You're more likely to feel it on your wrist, but underwater is where it really comes alive. Eddie Landsberg saying, I didn't get the notification we were going to fix that this week. We're setting up that long rumored Twitter account that is just going to exist to let you know when we're broadcasting. We're not going to spam you. We're not going to send you two for one offers or 10% off a custos or whatever. We're just going to create this Twitter so you know when we're live because clearly YouTube is a fail and I hate you, YouTube. I'm sorry, but it's been good. We have to break up. Twitter, you're my new flame. Okay, and I can see Jaguar LeCoultre minus Jaguar LeCoultre. That's right, this is the LeCoultre dial. Watches made for the U.S. market by Jaguar LeCoultre, with very few exceptions, from about 1938 to about 1983 were signed LeCoultre. Because they were generally mid-priced watches that were penalized by U.S. tax policy at the time, they were cased up and timed in the U.S. They came over as knockdown kits, including hand, dial, and movement, and then a U.S company would case them up, usually it was something like Star Watch, and 
or DNA of New York. And you can see how the watch right here has that classic Lecoult signed US market dial that would have originally appeared on the watch in the late 50s, early 60s. So this is a tribute to a bygone era of Giger Lecoult. Very few Giger Lecoult watches came over in that period. The few you'll see are watches like the 1958 Geophysic, which was priced so high, it wasn't subject to mid-price watch tariff policy. Well, since we're on Giger Lecoult, we may as well run with it. This is a watch like mine, but it is not mine. I would never sell. You would have to cut it off my wrist. I own number 83. This is number 132. It's the Giger Lecoult Duomet Chronograph 2010 White Gold Limited Edition of 200 pieces. Now, what you're looking at is a movement with two power reserves, one for the chronograph, one for the time of day two separate displays, one for the chronograph, one for the time of day. So everything that you see that's rose gold is part of the chronograph display, including the power reserve scale. Everything you see that's white gold is the time of day. Note that it has center seconds for the time. So it has running seconds at center for the time of day dial, as well as center seconds and a foudreon, a flying second, for the chronograph. Also note that not only do you have superimposed hours and minutes for the chronograph, but there is actually a scrolling single digit chronograph minute disc at the bottom. Now you stop all of this, reset it, and just like that, we're zeroed. So how does it work? Two mainspring barrels means two power reserves. The idea being, when you start a conventional chronograph, you wind up losing amplitude because you've increased the power draw of the watch without increasing the power supply. Here, you can wind with one crown, both mainspring barrels, both 50 hours. Now you have two mainsprings, two drive trains, one escapement switching the power between the two, one, two, one, two, one, two running both functions of the watch so that when you double the power drain by activating the chronograph, you also double the power. So the watch doesn't lose amplitude and can run at chronometer levels of precision in spite of the fact that a chronograph is running. You can also see that the movement is beautiful as it's composed of German silver, or since we're in the Valley du Jeu with this watch, my shore, or a nickel copper zinc material. The reason it looks gold is because of the copper. So it's not like rhodium plated brass on a Swiss watch. It looks more like a longa movement or more specifically, the 19th century pocket watch that inspired this model line. 42 millimeters in white gold. I adore mine. I've owned it for four years. I'm never gonna sell. So with 200 made, I control one half of 1% of the world's supply. Will you control the other half of 1%? You can now. 200 pieces, beautifully executed, and double finished case flank. Check out these welded lugs. You can see that there's a step between the case and the lug. That's not a lug held on by a screw like you'll see on a longa. That's the real thing. That's a welded lug, old school, with all evidence of the soldering and the joint removed to create a double finish. You see the polish and the satin, polished lug, satin flank, a step between them, hand finished with welding and then removal of the welded material. Absolutely gorgeous. This is a JLC that's finished to the level of a Patek, one of the few for which I can actually highlight that distinction. That's a special watch. And I had a question, was that the new 2018 Deep Sea, the 126660? No, this is the, this is the 116660. All right. I can see Zach Blass saying mainsprings look like turntables in that JLC. That's right. And the hits keep coming jukebox style from that thing. Four years I've owned that watch. I have not gotten tired of it. It is always engaging, always animated, always an instant icebreaker when I have to introduce someone who's not into watches to watches. So let's end with a watch that just blows my mind because frankly, I don't know why we don't see more of them. It is the most attractive yellow gold Rolex ever made. This is the anniversary dial GMT Master II. So this is the dial you get if you're really a Rolex fanboy. If, as they say, you bleed green, then you need green. This is a watch that came out in 2005. It was the first GMT Master with a trip lock crown, a ceramic bezel, a super case, a solid link, center link, end link, and milled clasp design. It was the first of the GMT Cs, as they call them, and absolutely gorgeous. You've got that yellow jacket color scheme with Rolex green gilt printed 
dial with yellow gold indices and hands. Now there's a little bit of an inversion compared to the black dial version of this watch. Since the date disc is printed black on white instead of green on white, but you have that glorious Rolex green dial and inside caliber 3186. So there's no shake and shimmy to the 24 hour hand when you set in the local time zone. This is a watch that simply sizzles. Normally I say this is a South Beach or a Miami Beach type watch, but frankly, this thing has so much style, I'm gonna rely on you, the man, to make the watch and not the other way around. Wear it with pride in conservative environs like Chicago, London, New York, and our hometown here at Watchbox, Philly. Let me give you a wrist shot of this. This was a new generation of Rolex, and frankly, I can't think of a better way to inaugurate than with the anniversary dial, so-called because the original GMT Master debuted per Rolex in roughly 1955. So this watch coming out in 2005 was a 50th anniversary present to the GMT Master line, and I can't imagine getting it any other way. The black dial is, the black dial is okay. The black dial's handsome. The black dial's almost restrained for a full gold watch, but if you want a sizzle, you have gotta go with Rolex green. It's just in the DNA of the watch, and if you're a Rolex collector, it's in your veins. That is just gorgeous. What else do I have for you? This is a little bit of a sneak peek of what you'll find on the Watchbox website, but we're getting more and more into vintage these days, and I can't think of a better way to get into vintage than two Hoyer chronographs. From 1972, this is the Hoyer 1163 Ottavia Viceroy edition with the rotating tachymeter bezel and the caliber 12 micro rotor automatic. Right here, this is the end of the line Hoyer. This is Hoyer in 1983, just before the Lemagna Piaget buyout ousted the Hoyer family. This is the Regatta 600 series 134.603. It is a Regatta timer powered by a Lemagna 1345. Both of these watches in classic tonneau style cases, redolent of their era on their original bracelets. This one is actually on a Hoyer bracelet. This one is on a Spiegel extensible US made bracelet from the period. Both stunning, stylish, and entirely original. You can only see these on the watch box. Folks, thank you so much for joining in from Environ's Far Flung. If you got up early, if you stayed up late, from me, Brian Govberg, and the entire Watchbox family, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Tim, they're the crew, time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.